it. That's me. That's Aaron. Yes, we are a Shopify partner. We have been in this space. Oh, and my cat is making an appearance as well. You'll see him. Um, we have been in working with Shopify since 2017. This is my cat. He makes an appearance every single workshop, no matter what I do. Um, we've been working in the Shopify ecosystem since 2017. We have been running 2H Media since a little bit before that. So we've been, we've been working with Shopify quite a bit. Um, specifically, we are a marketing agency. Yes, those are all the services we actually provide on the left side there. I'm not gonna read them out to you. But communicating, whether it be through a website, whether it be through email marketing, through digital advertising, any kind of medium um, where you're actually communicating with a potential customer or a, an existing customer, um, this workshop is definitely for you. Buddy, it's not dinner time yet. Right on. And again, we'll be joined by Aaron in just a minute here. What we're actually going to learn today, buddy. <laughs> What we're actually going to learn today, I'm hoping you actually all can see this, which, which would be good. Uh, what we're actually going to learn today, we're going to understand looking at your different customer segments, understanding their needs, goals, wants, ambitions, things like that, formulating your brand messaging, which hopefully all of you have kind of started if you've been in business for a little bit. Designing a marketing communication, communication strategy for your business is going to be kind of all the way throughout this. And then there is time for Q&A. Yes, there's lots of time for Q&A. Um, if you have questions at any point through this, great. Let me know. Give me just a quick second, and we're going to get on to this. My cat is just next level. Next level. Right on. Okay, what is it? Very quick definition, just so that we're all on the same page. Market communication strategy just outlines how your business or any business communicates its values and connects with your audience through visuals, through video, through words, through iconography, through all things. So like communication just doesn't need to be through written text. It's how you treat your customers when they walk in the door. It's how they feel when they're interacting with your packaging. It's essentially all aspects of your business when it comes to communicating. And as human beings, we've got a bunch of different senses that we communicate with. So it's not just through the visuals. It is going to be through the sense of touch, taste, smell, sight. And then of course, yes, reading, writing, all of the, the fun ones as well. Let's talk about a quick working example before I'm gonna have everyone download. Oh, there's my cat on my keyboard. Buddy, you're killing me here. Here's a working example. So we've got a new customer working example, an existing cu uh, customer example and browsers. So a browser might just be someone that's not actually in the market, but they're just taking a look. Um, but a new customer is someone that is actually in market, but they haven't made a decision yet. And a, an existing customer is someone that has either purchased from you in the past or has purchased um, or has had a very, very strong impact in your business, whether that you've, you've worked with them as a partner or maybe you've done some sponsorship stuff with them. Um, but let's talk about the new customer to start. Yes, we need to identify where they're finding their information. So yes, just because you're on TikTok doesn't mean all of your audience is on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or on Google ads or using some piece of social media or YouTube, you're going to need to identify what sources of information they are actually using um, day to day. And that includes what channels on those, on those platforms they are using. So who do they watch? Where do they spend their time? When do they spend their time? How are they actually interacting in those, in those environments? And then obviously being present in those channels. So yes, if your audience is predominantly male, and you are um, trying to work with them or trying to attract more of a male audience, yeah, YouTube is gonna be the place to go. You are going to need to produce content on YouTube for sure. You're gonna to need to do something in that space if you are going to try and get their attention. Um, and of course, leveraging online views for that new customer. Obviously they have no 
um, prior history with you, they're probably going to read about your business before making a choice on a specific product or service. Existing customers, cool. They probably are, they definitely already know you. They've already interacted with either a product or service or multiple products or services. Um, we're going to need to, we're going to need to look at different things. So we're going to break that down, customer lifetime value. So CLV, customer lifetime value is just how much that, that potential customer will spend over the lifetime of shopping with you. So if you're running a subscription-based business, you'd be very familiar with that. But this, this existing customer, when do they start their search again? How often are they purchasing? Are they recommending you to other people in their network? Why are they choosing you over someone else after their first impressions with your product or service? And then browsers, the customers that have browsed your site didn't make a purchase, but you know maybe they're just coming to you for information or they're gathering some research on specifically on your business. We definitely care about what they view, what they read, what pages they go to, what pages they don't go to. And then there's some pretty sweet tools in uh, multiple advertising platforms that will actually allow you to retarget people that have actually visited your Shopify store. So very, very important to at least identify who the browsers are and what they're actually browsing. Cool. Everyone can go and download this. We are going to be actually walking through this document section by section. It's a purchasing decision process model. It's five steps. I will put a link in chat. Give me a second. I will put a link in chat where you can download it if you haven't already downloaded. It's completely free. It's by us. It's just how we put things out there so that you can actually get them when we're doing virtual workshops. Cool, I'm gonna give everyone a quick minute to download that. I just put it in chat. Right on. If you have any questions about the download, if it doesn't work, let me know. But we are going to spend a little bit of time going through this step by step and how this is actually going to help you with your communication strategy. So I'm just going to take a brief minute here, make sure everyone can actually access this. This is free. You can download this as many times as you want. You can share it around. It's, it's, it's available for commercial download. You can use it for your business. This is so Sprint Point is just a resource platform that 2H Media uses to share the documents that we use in our workshops, as well as documents we use in our general business practices when we're interacting with our clients. So absolutely, if you want to download that, awesome. If there's any trouble, let me know. Cool. Perfect. And it does look like Aaron has joined us, which I'm going to have Aaron introduce himself in just a minute here as he gets set up. He's coming. He was fighting traffic to get into the office today. He's been busy. He's running other workshops. And this should, this document should just open in a normal PDF viewer on your computer. You can print it. It's just a standard eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. There's nothing fancy about it at all. Hello. There he is. Aaron, how are you? Not bad yourself. Doing well. Do you want to introduce yourself to everyone here? Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm one of the co-owners of 2H Media. <laughs> Aaron is, he, yes, he is one of the co-owners. He's going to help. A little bit throughout this workshop, Aaron is very, very good with his words. Um, and he's got tons and tons of experience actually helping businesses display and communicate their messaging with businesses, both in store, online, print catalog, all of it. Um, so he's going to be popping in and out today. If you want to connect with Aaron, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give him your social media now, Aaron. That For sure. Would, that would be a good idea. If you want to connect with Aaron, here he is in the chat, his LinkedIn, that's where we play on LinkedIn. He will absolutely accept your connection if you've got questions for him or myself later on down the road. We'd be happy to help. Let's get back to this. Okay, the purchase decision process model, it's got five steps. Each one of them builds on the previous. Let's get going. So 
The first one, step one, is the need recognition. So this is true for both existing customers and new customers. They will have a need for your product. They wouldn't buy it. They wouldn't continue to buy it. They won't buy it again and again and again if their need is being met somewhere else. So we need to understand their need, their want, what they're actually searching for. In order to create a communication strategy, we actually need to know what we should be telling that customer. So we actually need to just identify some of their problems. And again, problems can be a want, maybe they're like, they're just hungry, or maybe they're looking for a substitute in their life. Maybe they're looking for a luxury purchase. Maybe they're looking for a gift. So it's not actually a need. Maybe it's, it's a little bit of gift. And we need to understand why they are making their search in the first place. And on that, on that process. There's three steps that we can actually do to actually help communicate this. It's we actually need to display your unique selling points online. So that should be visible on your Shopify store or any other, like this is not just specifically to Shopify, even though it's a Shopify workshop. If you're using multiple platforms, if you're also selling on Amazon or on Wix or Etsy or any other platform, you definitely need to communicate your unique selling points. So maybe your product is just better built or it's built in Canada or it's built in the United States or it's built somewhere where the country of origin is very important. We need to communicate those things. A lot of times someone will start their search, whether it be on Google or a search engine, whether it be in social media, they'll be adding something onto that search, like looking for barbecue made in North America, looking for something with an adjective or a verb on, on the end of it that we want to come back and attribute to your business. So your unique selling points need to be visible online. Those need to be visible very, very clearly. And they should be very representative of not only your business, but your consumer base as well. You definitely want to note the potential problems that, that lead customers to you. So when, for if I use Little example, most people barbecue in the summer and the weather's just warming up here in Ontario. So that's why I'm taking a, a more summertime approach. Um, they'll be starting to look to facilitate their need potentially in advance. We go through a lot of this through Black Friday, Cyber Monday, people are going into their gift giving season. So we definitely, there definitely is some seasonality to this. And so based on your products, when when in general where will, will these potential problems present themselves so yes seasonality comes into play um, if they've made a purchase previously and now they're out of let's just say you're selling toothpaste you know maybe you sell it in a specific container that is good for about 45 days when do you actually need to get in front of your customer again well it's before they run out of toothpaste they don't want to go a few days without it you're going to want to have them to have a continual flow of toothpaste for them to brush their teeth so the goal there is to take note of where the potential problems happen, whether it be a time, whether it be a usage problem. And then you're going to absolutely need to build your business in those areas. So that means you need to be on the channels that we spoke about before, where your customers actually are. So does that mean you need to get into a retail store? Maybe. Does that mean you need to have uh, multiple selling points online? Maybe. Does that mean you need to sell um, or promote your brand through video? Maybe. It depends where your audience is. I would ask if you have any specific problems, or if you're not sure about any of this, like what, what problem does your customer have? What problem are you solving? Throw those in chat. Happy to take a look at some of your answers for sure. And again, the more you give, the more you get. If we want to use your business as a working example, that's cool too. We're going to work through a B2B example and a B2C example on this needs recognition. Great. Step one for the B2B side, a business wants to attract a larger audience online in a different geographical area. That's what they're looking. They're looking to build their business in a different area. So great. Their home base is, let's just say, in Toronto. And now they're looking to expand into Ottawa or into Waterloo or London. They're going to, that is the need. That is the B2B need. The B2C example, the weather's getting warmer and I need new sandals. So like on an individual level, 
I'm looking for new footwear. Cool, we have two examples, Mika and Mariam, if, Mariam, if I pronounce your name right. We're selling luxury items that actually, what actual problem are we solving? So luxury items, yeah, so luxury items are what? Is it jewelry? Is it what actually is, what are the luxury items? So people like looking good, so the need to actually look good if, if they're, oh, perfumery, cool. So the need is people like to smell good. People like to leave a lasting impression. People want others to actually treat them with um, a specific level of status. So just when it comes to, to that, before I get into the other one, the other example, um, luxury items still service a need. A Lamborghini still acts as an automobile. It will get you from place to place, ensure you're gonna not violate too many of the traffic laws, but at the end of the day, it's, a, it's, still, it's still a vehicle. It's gonna get you from A to B, even though it's a luxury item. So with perfume, it's still going to do all of the things that a cheap perfume would do. It's just going to do them differently. It still acts as the same device. So what need, why do people use perfume or deodorant in general? People like to smell good. Why do they like to smell good? Why do the particular type of clients you are trying to attract, why do they value their appearance? So very, very important is why do my, why do my customers or potential customers value themselves? What unique traits do they have? Cool. I sell organic, vegan date and tahini spreads. Ooh, it sounds good. The need is usually I need sweet spread, but prefer a healthier option. Cool. So there's a few things in there. So right on organic. So like not only that, so great. You're selling a food product. That food product has a few attributes to it. Like it is vegan, cool. Is it made locally? Is it sourced locally? Are the things, are the things actually produced without any additional? Absolutely. So there's tons of people that value buying local produce. There's tons of people that value buying organic things, no preserves, etc. You got it. And there's going to be a specific group of audience that cares about those things. And there's going to be lots of people that don't, and that's okay too. And the people that care are the people that are going to be adding those things into their search. So if they're looking for a specific tahini spread, they're probably going to start their search by adding that word organic or vegan or vegetarian or something because they know what they're looking for. You're also going to have people that are just going to stumble onto it and are looking for an alternative. But again, the more we can communicate those extra brand values at the search level, the easier it's going to be. And it's made locally, cool. Is it done in like small batches? Is it artisanal? Is it coming like five flavors? Like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that you can add into there that are going to help with that. And again, those things you don't want to take for granted because I guarantee you, you wouldn't want to be eating anything, any type of tahini spread that I made because it wouldn't, it wouldn't fulfill your goal. I wouldn't trust myself for doing it. But you need to add those things into your brand for sure. And I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do because those are some, some core elements to the actual product. But we want to make sure people understand what that actually means for them. So yes, the, 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 vegan, the vegan market is normally a fairly educated set of a group of, a group of people, but we still, there's new people that join that, that lifestyle every, each and every day. So we need to ed educate them as well. So great. Number two is gonna lead right into that. So thank you for those examples. It's the information search. Cool. I'm gonna start with the perfume example because the, the luxury example plays on different aspects than the food example. Where do people start their information search? So who else wears this type of perfume? What perfumes do the celebrities wear or the notable figures in their specific social circles or the people that they look up to? So that information search is going to be fairly paramount. It's going to be done in different ways. Some people, yes, we think about information search and immediately you're going to jump to Google or you're going to be thinking about searching online for something. Cool. There's a ton of other things. There's a ton, a ton, a ton of other things. There are obviously word of mouth. And again, when you have someone that is smelling good, there's a good chance that you're going to ask them, wow, that smells really good. What is that? Happens, happens, it doesn't, it doesn't particularly, it hasn't happened for me too much over COVID because of the social distancing that we've all hopefully been doing. But as we get together again, 
people are just naturally going to be in proximity of each other. And that just happens. That just happens. So yes, the word of mouth is super important. There also is a great deal of, of influencers that are doing this too. And influencers, I, I say lightly because they don't need to be a social media influencer. It's just anyone that has influence in your life at all, whether that be a colleague, whether that be someone on your sports team, whether that be a coach, a mentor, someone, someone in your life that influences some of your decisions, we're definitely going to want to be in touch with them. Of course, there are blog articles that will be talking about fashion and perfumes and things like that, just as well as there'll be blog articles talking about food products. So we definitely want, we should, what you should be doing is identifying those sources. So who can recommend our product for us? Where do people naturally start their, their journey when they're looking for a perfume or something to eat? Where? And that's going to be a long, long list. This will be like a never ending list for you to do. You should probably do this on a, a monthly basis is great. I'm gonna try and discover five new food blogs that I didn't know about last week or the last month, I'm gonna reach out to those content creators. I'm gonna ask if they wanna interview me. I'm gonna ask if they wanna do something. They're looking to create content as well. Cool, and the same thing is in the perfume space. Great, who is actually doing the reviews? Where do I actually need to position this product? Where are people getting their information? So the more you can talk, the better it is. That's essentially why we share, I shared Aaron's LinkedIn before, I'll share mine at the end. There's going to be a right and wrong way how to approach these people probably not a good idea to just jump into their DMs. If there's a, there's normally a process, connect with them individually, find out a way to actually get their email address and send them a piece of mail. And then obviously online reviews, again, where are people learning about your product? So if they are, if they, if your product is easily found already, where can I actually find reviews on it? Whether that be on your store, whether that be on Amazon, whether that be on someone else's store, if you're, a if you're, if you're selling through a third party, Cool, let's actually go to a working example again. Again, building on it, the B2B example, the business owner is gonna talk with their referral network and they're gonna try and find an in into that new, that new geographical location, whether that be through a partner channel, whether that be through one of their manufacturers, but they're gonna talk with their network and they're gonna see, oh, maybe there's a trade show happening in that area that I can start attending, or maybe there's a community leader that I need to go talk to and I'm gonna start there. So the B2B example is going to be done through more of a one-to-one -one model. The B2C example is someone's actually going to start looking online and probably reading reviews. Great, whether I need a hiking sandal or I need something for the beach or I need something that isn't very expensive because, you know, maybe I'm going on vacation. I don't want to lose them. All kinds of things, but they're probably going to start online in some capacity. Cool. Every single person in this in this chat should know where their customers start looking for their product first. So that you should have, if you're thinking about, great, there's a, one set of people that look for my products online first. There's ones that are more traditional readers. Maybe they spend their time in audiobooks or maybe they spend their time in reading physical print. Okay, maybe I need to be there. There's tons and tons of local magazines that you should approach if, if you're looking at a, an audience that does things more in their traditional sense. In where I live, there's some fantastic uh, printed materials. One of them is Tuke, shout out to them. They do awesome stuff. And it's a community magazine that's distributed all over the place. And there's tons and tons of businesses that get into there, mostly food and, and beer oriented with like a local travel component. But like there will be a form of print media that, that will fit your, that your brand as well. You should know who those people are how big those segments are. You need to develop those over time. Again, in order to communicate with them, you have to reach them in the first place. Three, we're working down the list. So yes, I'm not gonna read off a slide here, but there is an alternate evaluation. So great. Normally people don't buy the first thing they see. It's odd, it's rare. Normally it doesn't happen. There will be a few options. If I was looking for sandals, I'm gonna be obviously looking for a few different brands, a few different makes, a few different colors. Maybe they're leather, maybe they're plastic, maybe they're something else. That's gonna be true of everything. And I wanna talk about that perfume and that food um, example quite a bit. Very difficult because perfume in, in general, 
is very is very it's very a very personal purchase and it's obviously hard to understand that what that's going to smell like before you've actually smelt it like what is that color without seeing it um that might be a good uh, opportunity to you know if specific users to give a sample i know that if you were to go to a department store you'll get those little you know those little samples and it's a great it's it's you're trying they're trying to give you what a realistic view of what it would be like if you purchased a full size product or maybe it's a gift and you're going to say okay i'm going to compare these five things and then i'm going to make my choice from there um you are going to need to obviously you are going to be in competition with someone else there's no free lunch out there we just need to know who that someone else is so your product is put on the shelf at the grocery store and you're a vegan tahini you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of different alternatives and your product needs to stand out. Speaking online, people, what normal people look at, are looking for, what does the customer service look like? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it non-existent? When I have a problem, what does the return policy looks like if this thing doesn't fit? Does it like, great, will this, will this keep in my vehicle if I need to you know, travel to from here to there? Are there any ingredients that I should be made aware of? Does it contain peanuts? Things like that. What is, what are, what is the information available and how do they actually compare your product to the next? All of these things you might take for granted, but your customer will not. Absolutely, they will not. They are not going to make any sort of assumption on your product. If it, if it doesn't say peanut free and I've got a peanut allergy, I'm going to assume it is not peanut free. Will not happen. So you actually absolutely need to educate your customer on that. The same thing is that for perfume, what does it smell like? You're going to try and do your best to describe it. I can't tell you the last time I've read the description for a specific perfume, but you're going to have to paint a picture for me so that I can understand what I'm actually buying, what it smells like. Because I want to make a purchase that, that actually works. Again, for this, great. That B2B business owner is gonna, is gonna ask for a few referrals from their network. They're probably gonna phone or email. So they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna immediately reach out to want to buy a product, but they're definitely going to want to probe and ask some more questions. So they're potentially thinking about something, but there's gonna be a big feel, feel you out stage in the B2B space. The B2C example is gonna be pretty straightforward. They're going to look at pricing. They're gonna look at availability, especially in today's age. They're going to compare. I just, I, we just threw some, some standard sandal companies there, Birkenstock, Kiva, Nike. They're going to look to compare. And obviously, a Birkenstock is very different than a Nike sandal. But based on their, what they're looking for, they're going to try and find something that fits their price point. And maybe they're looking for something more athletic or maybe something more leisure. But they're going to try and find and compare the best options for them. And they're probably going to try and find a sale. So that B2C market is probably going to try and find a sale for sure. Okay, the purchasing decision. Great. I'm sure everyone in here, if you've sold anything and it comes down to this, obviously you're gonna need to communicate how you're gonna get paid, how they wanna purchase in-store, pickup, online delivery, how to get from here to there, how much is shipping, all of that stuff. We don't want to lead anyone away at this point. But definitely you need to communicate with them. The cat is going. What happens when you adopt a cat through COVID? They just, they're clingy. He's good at the best of times. Buddy, buddy, we're talking about purchasing decisions right now. Um, great. Some products, especially if you're selling a subscription, are very, very, are very, very impactful with this, where they've got multiple purchasing decisions on whether or not you want a three-month supply, a one-month supply, buy for the full year if you're selling software. Um, very true of if you're selling anything in bulk as well. So if you're selling tahini to another retail store on that B2B space, you're definitely going to need that, that purchasing decision will just be bigger. And we're, we definitely want to make sure we're talking to the right people. That's probably done offline. Cool. What your business should do at this stage. Yes, we want to make it easier. So if you're in the B2B space, a sell sheet, quantity breakdowns, 
anything like that in terms of of explaining how they can get their product faster, what the delivery looks like, who they actually, when the restocking happens, all of that. You need to tell people how this is actually going to work. The same thing goes for the B2C space. Yes, tracking codes. Yes, if you're on Shopify, that's very easy to just to communicate a tracking code with, with a customer. But explaining that this is going to take three days or two days or one day or whether it's express or standard, will they get it before the holidays? Very important. You'll see businesses do that. Buy it today, get it by Christmas. There's tons and tons of value into that. And then of course, if you've got a physical store, the staff are absolutely going to need, you know, would you like a bag? You want gift wrapping? You want like what, what is actually going to go on in terms of the customer experience there? It's easier in store. You can control a little bit more than online. Cool. In the B2B space, that business owner is going to engage further. They're going to probably ask for a quote. They're going to probably going to scope some stuff out. Cool. The e-commerce space is going to be a lot easier than the B2B example. Great. They're just going to move forward with their purchase and they're going to place an order online. It doesn't end there, especially for the communication for how you're actually going to continue to have that customer buy from you. Step five, which is normally the forgotten step is post-purchase. So yes, you've got their money and they've got your product and hopefully they're enjoying it because I know you'll be enjoying their money. The post-purchase behavior is going to be something that is very, very important. It's we're going to give them a little bit of time to reflect on their decision. So yes, they need time to use the product just because they bought the tahini today doesn't mean they ate it the minute they got it home. We need to give them a little bit of time to actually consume it, interact with it, have a good representation of what they actually purchased. Maybe they have to get someone else's opinion on it. And then there should be some amount of communication that happens between your business and them after the fact. So normally if I was to buy, if I was working with one of the bigger retailers or one of the bigger manufacturers, let's just say it was a car manufacturer, just because I bought the Ford truck doesn't mean I stopped seeing the Ford truck ads. They're going to continue to be on TV. They're going to keep telling me that their purchase, the purchase I made is, you know, it's bulletproof and it's not going to rust and it's going to drive over that mountain if I wanted to. It's going to do all the things they promised it and they're going to continually hammer it home. Cool. You will need to do the same. Even though you don't have the assets that Ford does, you'll still need to communicate all of those things. The biggest thing that smaller business sh should do is you should reach out and ask for feedback, whether that be a B2B, like what we do, Part of my job is reaching out back to people saying, how did you find their services? What's something that we can improve on? Would you recommend this to somebody else? What did you like? Example, 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 example. If it's a consumer purchase, I'd ask them for a review. What do they think? How do we want to make our products better? Do you want to take a survey? What did you eat our product with? How did you find out about us? Would you be interested in providing us more value in order to be included on our next sale, something like that. Here's 15% off the next purchase. We can get more feedback from someone by simply asking them. Not everyone's going to say yes. There's no certainties. But it is certain if you don't ask and if you don't iterate your product and if you're not taking their feedback into consideration and if it's not good, there's a good chance that they'll stop by. So we also want to understand what other people say about your product, service, brand online. So Looking at that from a 50,000 foot view is, is making a couple of quick searches, looking at what others are saying about your product. Maybe that is happening on Twitter. Maybe that is happening in specific social circles, Facebook groups. Um, but we definitely want to figure out what people are saying about your product, even if they're not willing to talk to you. And then, yes, if your product requires customer service, let's just say there's, there's it comes with a warranty. Let's just say there's like complex assembly instructions. Maybe there's something that they're going to get later on as well if it's part of the service. We definitely want to interact with those, those customers. The easiest thing to do here when it comes to customer service is write down every question you receive. Anytime you get asked a question in business, write it down and find a way to answer that better. And at the end of the week, you'll end up having 300 questions written down and you're going to see a lot of duplicates. And the goal there is those duplicates means that question is a high value question for a lot, a lot of people. And we want to answer those questions without them having to ask because we want them to have the, that information straight up. 
So whether that needs to be communicated through video or maybe that needs to be uh, sent through an email directly after a purchase, or maybe someone needs to be told something based on some complex issue. The goal there is if you're actually able to record those questions, there's a good chance you're gonna be able to answer them and provide that value sooner. Cool. And at the end of this, at the end of this decision model canvas, decision purchase process model, there should be that post-purchase behavior. So like I said, both of them, that post-purchase behavior in the B2B space is very different than B2C, even if there's some, there's there'll always be a little bit of overlap, but they are very different. During that engagement, great, prompt for feedback, make sure someone's voice is heard, um, be communic like again, continue that relationship, figure out how you can do better next time if, if things kind of went off the rails. And then of course, the B2C, ask for reviews, set their expectations, keep people informed of when, where your products will be if you're doing something seasonal. Um, ask if they wanna be added into an email list. Don't spam the heck out of them. But definitely, if you ask, there's a good chance. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. Cool. With that, we are going to get into, okay, great. We've captured some of that information from our audience. Now, what the heck do we do with it? Like, they're probably thinking, Matt, we actually, we came here to communicate, but we, we need those things in place first. So we do that through what's called a marketing persuasion. It's fairly straightforward, but very complex at the same time. So if you're interested, I've got it on my desk because I read it all the time. There's a sweet book. It's called Influence. And we're going to go over a few of those things. It was not written by me, written by people far smarter than me that are in that do with uh, deal with how how people are susceptible to specific marketing tactics. There are six of them: reciprocity, authority, scarcity, social proof, commitment, and liking. You will have absolutely you have seen all six of these. There's a good article. I'll actually have. Sarah post that article, if you would please. There's a, a great, the principles of persuasion. It's honestly a great read. These six do not apply to all brands. Based on the brand, based on your customer base. So the luxury brand is probably going to deal with scarcity. The vegan tahini brand is probably not. Because why the heck should you be hard to find? Why would you want to have an elusive brand with any kind of so there's different things. There are different, there are different marketing plays for each type of business. And we want to leverage those based on the data that we just collected from our customers' decision-making habits. So here it is. It's another quick worksheet. So some of these things will be will be important to your brand and some of them won't. I'm going to post this link in chat as well. Give me just a second. This is like this gets into psychology like crazy. But yes, there's the link. I just posted that in chat for you. You can download it. It's going to go through all six of these. And you're essentially going to have to choose like the two to three that are going to apply most to your type of business, your type of customer base. Again, the, the selling perfume and selling a, a vegan alternative is completely different. And they're going to want to be talked to and communicated with completely differently. So guess. I need everyone just a minute to download that if you haven't already. So some of these things will be relevant to you and some of them won't, but I do ask for your patience and stick around and you'll learn a thing. And you've, you've probably been marketed to one way or another in one of these six tactics, I can almost guarantee it. And then, right, Sarah, Sarah just put the HubSpot article. It's a fantastic article. We have no problem sharing good resources, no matter where they came from. Um, it is absolutely fantastic that article from hubspot was actually written by or in partnership with the gentleman that actually wrote this book it's a very good book and if you are interested in learning more about like marketing tactics i suggest you read it it's available on audiobook and all that thing all the good stuff okay marketing persuasions I'm going to ask, once I get through this, I'm going to ask Aaron what his favorite is or his favorite marketing tactic he's ever seen. If you've seen one of these in, in example that just caught your eye on how good it was, I'm absolutely, you can absolutely share your example, but I'm going to get going here. The first one, first one is reciprocity. 
Reciprocity is a fairly um, is fairly common. It's not anything that anyone can't do. It's not like you you shouldn't use this one. There's there's no there's no downside to this. We use this. So again, we are our brand. We want to be known for sharing content. We want to be known for transparency. We want to be known for offering things for free in order to make you feel good. That's why this workshop is free. So there's lots and lots of businesses that can do that. Costco does that with free samples. So like Costco is very different than 2H Media. Um, Costco will do that because they want to be known for a, a great deal of just customer service and they want people to feel invited and welcomed in their stores and having people eat in their stores generates that feeling. So yes, free and exclusive content, free consultation sections, gifts, free samples, all kinds of things there will fit. And it all depends on if this actually fits your business model. I have never gone into a Best Buy and been offered a free set of headphones. It's never happened. Best Buy does not use reciprocity. Costco, they absolutely will. They absolutely will. Um, so different different businesses will use it. I've never been in, in a, I haven't, I haven't been in the law of laws in a long time, but they use reciprocity far fewer times than Costco. Any given day you walk into Costco, you're going to find something. Law of laws, unless there's a specific promotion on something, not going to happen. So can your business do this? And is it something that you want to be known for? Yes or no. Whether it be, again, should your brand be more shareable? Uber does, Uber Eats does this, like have a friend join and get $15. And there's, there's tons of software companies that do it. And again, they're trying to build community. If community is important for you, definitely something you can consider. Back to the perfume option. It's kind of like that. Like again, the free samples are kind of a reciprocity play. Like you can kind of share this. They're kind of for you though. So it's kind of a, a little weird mix. I wouldn't really consider it a reciprocity uh, play, even if you're going to give someone a free sample. Most people, most people I know don't share perfume. I, I've been wrong before. Authority. This is where per, the perfume brand will absolutely shine. Um, great. Um, authority is a play that, that you want to be the best in, best in class. So Nike for shoes, Tesla for electric vehicles. Um, they're probably not going to use the previous um, marketing persuasion. Nike's not giving out free shoes to anyone off, off, off that comes into the store. Tesla's not doing you any favors either. They're trying to be the best in class. So the authority is I'm the best. This, this is the, the top of the line. These are the premium ingredients. This is sourced at the best places. This is handled with the utmost care. It's got the most technology in it. And it's got the highest amount of, of care put into it. So again, if you are a luxury brand, this is probably something that you're going to want to focus on because you are selling to a crowd of people that care about the importance of their product. Not everyone, but for the most part, great. So you're going to show off the fact that you are best in class and you're going to do that through your product packaging. You're going to do that through um, communicating at the level that a you're not going to use the same marketing tactics of sending an email every single day to your customer base saying to buy their product. No, it's, it's done more discreetly than that. You're going to have to fit in with some of these other brands. Now, what I haven't mentioned is the best way to actually start this, if you're unsure, is you can find brands that are do a good job of each one of these tactics, and you can join their email list. You can follow them on social media. You can see what they're actually doing day to day, and you can frankly steal some of their ideas and apply them to your own brand. So with authority, you can absolutely you can absolutely see how they're actually trying to portray that. Nike is going to sponsor the best athletes. They they just will. They're not they're interested in winning. Tesla is interested in showing off their stats. They're in, interested in showing off why they're the best. You're going to try and do that that the same way. So you're not going to be able to cut take too many shortcuts with authority, but again, you're going to get generate more and more views. So if you are a luxury brand. You're probably going to have to spend more time designing your ads. You're going to spend more time um, editing your videos. You're, you're going to have to kind of fit in with the space uh, a little bit differently. Social proof. Social proof. If I care what other people think of my brand, so I can guarantee you in the previous one, Michael Jordan did not care about anyone but winning. 
He did not care about what other people felt about him on the court. He was going to win. He was notoriously an asshole. If you've watched The Last Dance on Netflix, I'm going to use the, the little bit of knowledge I have on Michael Jordan there. They don't, he doesn't care about social proof. He cares about how many championship rings he's got on his hands. Other brands, so not Michael Jordan, not the people that care about authority, the leaders of the pack really don't care about this, this will care about social proof. And that's going to be what people actually think of the food. If I'm the best restaurant, if I'm at a Michelin star restaurant, I don't care what you think. I care that I've got my Michelin stars. With social proof, you're really going to care about Google My Business reviews, testimonials, case studies. You're going to really try and figure out how people are actually using your technology, product, service, uh, and how it's helping. So you're going to definitely try and increase the word of mouth. You're definitely going to try and get in to create a a product champion, they call them. So someone that's actually going to champion your product in the household that is going to absolutely say, no, don't buy this, buy this because it's better. You're going to want to foster those people and you're going to want to talk to them. Small businesses, the best way to do this is picking up the phone and call. Call, if you've got a retail location and you've got uh, some a, a retail location that is forward facing that, that people are coming into every day now that the kind of COVID is behind us, your staff need to be trained to ask for a review. A QR code should be available on your receipts in terms of sending people home with something. If you need to generate or have a contest or a survey in order to get this social proof, that's going to be something that is going to be really, really important to do. And again, this isn't going to be for every business. B2B businesses, it's fairly, it's fairly important because your network has a lot of power. So within the B2B community, social proof is fairly important. If you look at any software website, they list all the other companies they support. They've got a logo grid on their site saying, hey, we're, we're supported by Google and YouTube and all of the, all of the people and so on, so on and so on, many million, millions of users use it. Where if, um, if you're a tahini brand, you're not going to list, okay, we were, you know, so-and-so bought our tahini and, and loved it. You're not going to feature that on your website, but you still will probably have a review section, but it won't be as prominent. Commitment. Commitment is obviously a different one. If I go back to the Nike example, just do it. They're trying to get the commitment play in there. Very important for subscription services so like Peloton. Very important for any of like the Razor brands where they're, where they're trying to get people to subscribe to getting a new Razor every 30 days. There's lots of upselling that can happen and leading by example. So yes, you're gonna have a whole bunch of people that have like clean shaven faces. You're going to have people that are very, very interested in, in making sure that they're using their charcoal toothpaste three times a day. You're going to be looking for people to start with a small purchase and then generate commitment over time so that they're going to build this into a habit. So Fitbit does this, Apple Watch does this, any wearable. Um, if you are, pretty much if, you are, if your brand is a consumable brand, so if you're not like selling like a bicycle or a barbecue or some kind of fixture, um, you will likely be trying to make a commitment play so that people are turning to your product always when this when their problem arises. So great, we're going to have, we're going to put together a spread. I always want to think of that vegan tahini brand. So how do I create that, that commitment? It's little by little by little by little. In this case, it'd be like, hey, there's, there's a set of recipes. It goes with this. It pairs well with this type of food. These are the drinks that it goes with. Hey, we're going to include some healthy, uh, some healthy options that will actually explain that this is better. This, our product is better than this product, so that you can actually make a healthier alternative. And again, it's going to be a steady flow of content to actually create these this amount of commitment. Liking, so we've got two left. Liking, very hard to be relatable to Michael Jordan. So again, most luxury brands are not going to be into this into this market the relatability company story common value is very important so locally grown small batch produced people that care that it's done on the micro level very very important and that's why larger brands try and do this so one of the most common plays for one of the larger brands pc so if you look if you're to go into president's choice and you're going to go to their deli section you'll actually see like oh these potatoes were, were grown by this farmer or this chicken was raised by this 
this small farm out in Alberta. And they're trying to make a play by making a large brand seem smaller and more down to earth. Smaller business have an easier time of doing this, creating relatability, sharing company story. Oftentimes it's actually the owners or someone fairly high up in the leadership that's actually running the social media account. So you're gonna get those brand values through it. Again, there's some other things near like the Wendy's Twitter account, that liking was crazy because there's a lot of people that can relate to you know, this, this fictional, this fictional character, Wendy, who's actually, you know, running this social media account that's absolutely hilarious. And the goal there is not something that you'd expect out of a corporate chain. So can you be relatable? Can you share your story? Will people care about it? Can you create common values? Um, there's not going to be too many common values between a luxury perfume line and most people. It's just not going to happen. If you've watched a perfume commercial lately, it's someone jumping into like a majestic ocean and it's an unattainable figure that looks gorgeous in front of the camera and they're saying, okay, great. This is what this person is, is, is the lifestyle of this individual. So not a lot of common values, not really relatable, but people definitely look up to it like the Michael Jordan example. So liking not for everyone, but very important. Lastly, scarcity. I love scarcity. If it's done right, can be super, super impactful. So I'm sure someone, everyone in this room has seen like, buy in the next nine minutes and 52, 51, 50, 49 seconds, like it's going to run out, even though you know that there's a warehouse full of them. Um, that's, that is scarcity that used to work. It doesn't work anymore. There are better forms of scarcity that you can actually, that you can actually uh, um, employ for what you're doing. You can do limited runs. It's like, this is it. So Supreme does this fairly uh, effectively. We made a thousand. There are only a thousand. That's it. There's all kinds of collectibles. eBay is known best for this. Baseball cards. It's a limited edition. It's a one print. It's got a signature from someone on it. We can actually create a fair bit of value through scarcity in that play. So limited edition items, Seasonal items, so great. Maybe you are a clothing brand and you're going to do uh, one run of, of shirts or skirts or whatever you're actually making this season and then that's it. Very, very popular in the craft brew world. They make one, it's a limited run. If you miss it, you miss it. They've got four or five core beers on tap and everything else is new. And if you're interested, you're, you're going to get that liking. You're going to get people tuning into your social media posts because they're always going to be on their edge of their seats trying to learn about something new. And then low inventory deals are, are kind of scarce as well, saying, okay, great, this is our, there's five last in stock, this is it. Um, if you're trying to clear, clear stuff off the rack, very important. So scarcity is there. Aaron, do you have an example? Aaron, Aaron has got tons and tons of experience in e-commerce. Aaron, do you have a specific example of when one of these marketing persuasions in your life just absolutely just screamed like, well done marketing to you? Maybe. um that's a really good question i uh when you mentioned that you were going to call on me for uh example my favorite marketing campaign earlier earlier in the workshop there's a couple of examples that came to me um my favorite marketing campaign of all time i'm not actually sure which category would fall into and i'd love your thoughts on that yeah it's uh it came from alka-seltzer it was the plip plop alka-seltzer campaign that they ran Ooh. where they were trying to increase their sales. And so they came up with this buzz, this, uh, this catchphrase, clip flop alka seltzer. And what they did is they got the idea into people's heads uh, to use two tablets instead of one. You only needed one tablet for it to actually do the job, uh, but a second tablet wouldn't hurt you. And so by encouraging people to use two tablets instead of one, they actually drastically increased their sales uh, by causing customers to burn through um, the to burn through their supply of product way faster. I do remember that campaign. That I, I think would fit into the commitment campaign. That's your upselling. Like be committed to having two rather than one. Two, two will do be better than than one. Sure. Sure. I can Lots see of that. Lots of brands use that. Lots of brands use that. And I think the most common way they actually use that is through shrinkflation, where they'll say, here's the same recommended dose of tablets and there's 500 tablets of su supplement in the container, but you actually need to take two tablets with every meal rather than a, 
one regular strength tablet. So you you see it a lot. It's really popular in the yeah. toothpaste industry as well, where like you really need the smallest drop of toothpaste, but all the marketing material shows like the full squeeze of the Huge container across the brush. Full of toothpaste. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's that. I mean, that's my favorite. And then I came up with two examples because uh, the other one I wanted to touch on um, is one of ours, and I didn't want to. <laughs> like just spend too much time talking about our own work. I wanted to bring in like one of the greats from history as well. Uh, but one of the ones we worked on that I'm most proud of is our um, production of the Cannabis 45 podcast for Grow House Supply Co. Because um, oh. they were, they were a business business company in the cannabis space, really um, pushing to be you know, the one-stop shop for uh, professional growers trying to um, create a more efficient yields and better quality crop. And so we came up with this idea to create a podcast centered around uh, sharing professional facts and information in the industry from top industry sources. So not like a random, like a beer and popcorn kind of cons concept. So the whole thing was about creating authority by uh, showing the owners of this company associating with uh, different members of the community that had really, really powerful, impactful and relevant information. And um, the tagline for the podcast was the facts are nothing. And so we really leaned hard into that authority angle um, and really pushed on that right into the name of the podcast, which was named after Bill C-45, uh, which legalized cannabis in Canada. So we were trying to create the idea that uh, this company was, you know, really, really engaged, not only engaged in the market, um, but really closely connected with other authorities in the space. And so by extension would be a uh, trustworthy source to purchase from. And it's an award-winning podcast. It's, uh, it's done really well. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to push our own work too much. Like I said, that's why I focus on the Alka-Seltzer thing. Uh, but I also wanted to bring this one up as well, because it doesn't really get more direct in terms of uh, reflecting one of these marketing principles than when we say, okay, you know, we're going to do an entire uh, dedicated campaign built around one singular aspect of these persuasions. They're, they're very, very, um, I mean, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because they, it's going to lead to my next point. Most of the time when a small business owner is trying to do something, I'd, we, we always recommend doing one thing well than trying to do a smorgasbord of, of all things what is, what is, I think it's a quote from, from Parks and Rec, Ron Swanson, don't whole ass. So I can't, I can't remember the quote, but yeah, do something, do one thing really well. Don't, don't, don't half ass a whole bunch of things. Um, so with that in mind, if when you are trying to communicate with your audience, try to focus on one of these six things, and that's going to actually end up leading you to create some goals. So if you're focused on social proof, the goal this month is to generate X number of reviews, or it's going to generate five case studies or it's going to be to generate three people growing on our social media or 300 people growing on our social media that's what we care about if it is on commitment it's going to be a little bit more sales focused if it's on if it's on likelihood it's going to be how many blogs or how many email new subscribers i am going to be trying to collect scarcity it's how much stuff can i actually push how can i pre-sell something can i can i focus on on dollars Every single one of those things has different metrics and they can't all, you can't focus on all of them at once. It's way too hard to focus on all of them at once. So pick one, set a goal for yourself and it should fit more into your actual marketing strategy, which we're getting to right here. Great. The brand, the brand plays it. So great. We've got our customer data from the first worksheet. We've got how they make a decision, where they go, the information they're actually looking at, what else is affecting them. We've got the marketing persuasions down that we know psychologically will work. And again, I, I, I mean, those are reduced down into the, the, the big six. There are no more, everything fits into those categories. It is, it is a cumulative set. Now, where does your brand actually fit into this? So if your brand is a discount brand or if it's an alternative or it's a vintage line or if it's something, oh, my cat's really saying hi now. Um, your brand plays a really important part in this. So if, Buddy, yeah, you're going to be coming off my shoulder in a minute. If your brand is very, very likable and maybe it's for kids, you're going to try and find something that actually works a little bit better. Um, and you're going to have to pick and choose what marketing persuasions will actually work. So if your audience is a bunch of kids, yeah, scarcity is a really good one because 
Like everyone, you don't want to be left out of the Nerf fight and you absolutely want to be at the movie on opening day. And it, you can really use scarcity to play on, on younger minds in, a, in an ethical way. Um, it's not going to work so well with a more educated audience. That's just say, if you're selling musical instruments, it's like, I will just wait for the best one. They will just keep making them. There's, a, there's, there's an infinite supply of Teslas. I just have to wait. Um, with that, your message, the content and the timing. Thank you, Elenia. I swear this isn't staged. It's not like I've got like bacon in my pocket or anything like that. He's just, he's just here. Um, so your message, you have three main components, right? Your message, like what you're actually trying to say, it should fall under the line of what marketing persuasion you're using, the timing of it. You're going to need to do a little bit of research at when your audience is most in tune with, with the channels that they're, that they're, that they're um, focusing on. Um, if you've got like a, a huge um, adult audience that is working afternoon shift in, in factories, you might want to focus on releasing that content at 11 p.m. at night when they're done work. Or if you're selling a product to nurses that are, that are, are on a continental shift, they're probably not being able to interact with your, your content at you know, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard. It might be on the either end of the spectrum. So the timing is going to be really important. And then what communication channels they're actually there. So is it on YouTube? Is it on TikTok? Is it through Instagram Reels? Is it just a, a normal uh, Instagram story? Is it something that has paid behind it? Is it something that doesn't? Those channels you're going to have to look at and say, where does my audience spend the time? Where are they? If you're having trouble with that, at the end of this, I'm going to put some information about myself out there. If you're having trouble with that, we'd absolutely love to work with you if you're trying to develop a strategy and you're not you're not being successful at it do this for a living um, and it's good to get a second opinion so like you live and work in your business good chance having an outsider's opinion goes a very very long way um, so you don't need necessarily need to work with a specific company that only does marketing in your individual field just getting an opinion never hurts take it with a grain of salt but having an outsider's view is very very important as well when it comes to the strategy, when it comes to the strategy, choose your top two marketing persuasions. Oh, that's good. That's a good question. I am going to answer that question before I get onto this. How do you handle the timing of communication if clients are global, especially on social? That is a great question. Normally, bigger brands run separate social media accounts based on their where their audience is located so it'll be like it, it'll they'll have someone for the eu market they'll have someone for the north american market they'll have someone with for the the like the asian pacific market they'll have one for australia so they're going to have separate channels for that and again normally they're different because the products offered in different areas will have different potentially different instructions on them different language requirements They'll definitely have different posting time of day requirements. Um, I need to know a little bit more about your specific company or product that you're, that you're selling. But normally there is going to be more, more boots on the ground aspect, like we can identify with the cultures we're selling in. So even though we have, like, we're in Canada, even though that, uh, let's just say, um, England, Commonwealth, common, like we're, we're, we, we, we operate under the same legal system, the same monarchy, the same whole bunch of things, completely different cultures at the end of the day and different rules and regulations to sell over in England than there are in Canada, different taxes, different, there's a whole bunch of different things. Women's resort wear brand. Okay, so like swimwear? Is it like swimwear, outdoor wear, something like that? Well, while you're waiting on that answer, man, I'm gonna jump in. Um, I know the question was specifically uh, or highlighted social media, especially on social media. Um, but I do want to take a moment to add one of the best marketing platforms for dealing with global audiences is your email marketing uh, in terms of managing that timing piece. Because if you're using uh, a decent piece of email marketing software, we use Klaviyo. It integrates really well with Shopify. Um, it's going to give you the option to send your emails based on the recipient's local time instead of your time which means you're always gonna be sending people those emails at a reasonable time of day, 
we often send them uh, on people's lunch breaks, try to catch them in the middle of the workday. And um, sorry, Matt's cat is meowing at me now. <laughs> My cat's a, the cat's he's the friendliest me cat in the world. Um, so email marketing works really well from that perspective. And then also based on your Shopify integrations, you can send transactional emails, which are going to hit customers at exactly the right time uh, relative to when they made a purchase or interacted with your website. And that's going to be completely independent of where they are in the world because it's going to be based on their behavior on their site, on your site, uh, rather than when you set up that content in the first place. So I know that doesn't really tie into the social media question, which as Matt said, a lot of the bigger companies will have separate accounts, which is really the best way to handle it. Uh, there isn't a good social media platform um, for breaking that content down based on recipient time zones. With social media, you're really just pushing everything out into the aether and hoping it lands in front of people at the appropriate time. Uh, whereas email marketing gives you a lot more powerful control to finesse your messaging based on how people are interacting with your company. Yeah, if you're doing organic posting on like Instagram or Facebook or, or even like TikTok or, or YouTube, when the post goes out, the post just goes out. And the people that are seeing it are seeing it when they're active on the platform. So there's no, there's no real way to time when they, when your audience will see the messaging. If you're used a paid channel, you can absolutely set up that, okay, the people that are in Australia or the people that are in, in this specific geographical region are seeing it between these hours locally for them compared to uh, these other hours uh, in comparison to this geographical location. So when it comes to organic posting, uh, which we do recommend people do, it's, it's very, it's just difficult to have um, a, a right and wrong time with a global audience if you've only got one set of accounts. But the, the big thing there is, if I can have the frequency and uh, a consistent amount of volume, they're going to see my stuff when and, and how they choose to interact with the platform. That's just, that's just the, the way it works. The platform's not really going to do any help for you to display that content organically because you're not paying them. But with a, a steady flow of it, when someone logs in, when they see it, when they open up their phone, uh, when they have time, they will they will be interacting with that. Um, on top of the fact that if someone is, if they have liked or follow your content, there's a very good chance that when they log in the next time, the feed will naturally catch them up with all the content they've missed. So your content's just going to get sprinkled in with that. And I would just say, great, if I've got a global audience, I need a global amount of content. So I need someone, if I'm looking for a women's, I, I, if it's women's swimwear, it's like, great, I'll need someone on a beach and, that, and it looks like I'm in Dubai. And I'm going to need someone that's on a beach and it looks like I'm on the west coast of Canada with really, really tall cedar trees. And I'm going to need someone that's on the coast of, of again, somewhere else. And I'm going to try and make, again, they're going to have different, they're going to have different options. I'm going to have, again, a, a variety of, of models actually wearing my product that are representative of the geographical area that I'm actually trying to produce the content. So the inclusivity play has to be there. The relevancy has to be there in terms of selling it in the, in the, you know, Dubai doesn't look like a lot like BC, but if I'm trying to develop one market over the other, it has to fit the part. Uh, is there a necessity to having social? Is there a necessity to having social media presence? Presence. Um, that's a good question. Is there? Is it a necessity? It's only a necessity if your target customer is there. And so, for us, we do not operate a Facebook channel. None of our customers are on Facebook. We're a B two B business. We are not interested in selling our services through Facebook. That's not where the people that we interact with hang out. That's not where we spend our time. But if I was selling something else, if I was selling um, a service locally, I'd probably have a face, a local Facebook page to sell my product locally. And if I had a little local store that was in the downtown core of my city, then I'd probably operate one. So it's a necessity if your customers are spending a great deal of time there. And then I would say there's the likelihood that there's going to be a few of those channels. There's going to be the likelihood of like, oh, they spend a lot of time on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and, and, and it's like, you don't need to be in all places. You need to do one or two of those things very well. That's, that's, that's kind of tone back the try to be everywhere. Most small businesses don't have the resources or time to be everywhere. So be in one or two places and just do that really, really well. And then just kind of own that as a, 
I, this is the this is the time. This is my marketing budget, including time that I can dedicate to being on social media. So it's it's um it's a necessity if your bus if your a great deal of business is there for you to get. It's not as necessity if if it isn't. Cool. Right on swimwear, kimonos, cover ups, clothing worn at beach, pools, resorts, leisure wear. Cool. Yeah. So you're gonna definitely need a, a pretty good variety of of um, obviously it's going to be difficult to tell if you're a, on a beach in Australia or a beach in Turks and Caicos, because for the most people, a beach is a beach. And if the water is crystal clear and the sand looks really good and there's, it's sunny, a beach is a beach. So you're, you're not going to need to create too much differentiation there. Obviously Australia and Turks and Caicos are on two separate sides of the planet. So those, those audiences are, are going to be seeing people differently or are going to be seeing the things at different time. Um, there's no real way around that unless you're going to have separate accounts that do separate things based on time zone or, or continent. Um, mo I, I wouldn't recommend small businesses having uh, multiple, multiple social media accounts. It just spreads your audience too thin. It, it doesn't create, a, it's going to lower your engagement. It's like if you were to have like 250,000 uh, followers, you might you might start going. Okay, great. Do I have one hundred thousand in this area and then one fifty over here? But if you've got something like twenty, it's like you're going to spread yourself too thin across those channels. What tips would you give for an online thrift store to increase sales? Cool, great question. Online thrift store to increase sales. Uh, you are probably dealing with a huge influx of product all the time. So people are probably either donating things or they're, they're, you're doing some like third party trade. So like you're selling on behalf of someone else. Um, so normally you've got the, uh, you've got the advantage of variety. And that just means you're going to need to take pictures and post content as much as possible. Every time that you bring content into your store, you need to tell people that you have more inventory to sell. So a lot of this stuff, I don't go to Value Village often. Normally it's, it's if I'm looking for something like for a costume or if I've got a specific party to go to and I'm looking for something um, specific, there's a really good chance that if I'm going through that thrift store, I'm in discovery mode. I'm like, oh, I, I came here for like a really weird t-shirt to wear to a, an eighties party that I, that I don't have, but like, I'm going to spend two hours just browsing through all the stuff because it's fun. Other brands do that same thing. Sephora makeup brands do that. Everyone says, I found this at the store. So you didn't find it. The thrift store, you found it. Sephora, it was placed on the shelf specifically for you to pick up and buy. You didn't, you didn't find it at the store. You, you bought it at the store. So you, you have this sense of discovery from from a from a thrift store. So the more you can help people discover, the more you'll the more you'll sell. And that again, that's a labor intensive business model. It, you're not going to get any any economies of scale. Uh, it's not like you're trying to sell fifty of the same the same purse every month. It's uh, you're going to need to produce content like crazy. So I would recommend a light box, a couple of mannequins. It depends what kind of thrift stuff you're selling. But like yeah, someone is generating content four hours a day and posting it. If I'm trying to move a bunch of stuff, so I need to tell people what's new. Cool. And I know that's not like a great answer. It's just that you don't, you can't build, you can't build a, a, a ton of value around a product that you've only got one of. It, like it, if you're, if you're taking donations, it's like, this is it. I'm going to have what I have and I don't have what I don't have. And there's a good chance I've only got one of the thing. You're not going to get any any uh, economies of scale on that. What piece of advice would you give to a niche brand who wants to grow and find new clients without losing their existing clients' trust? I guess I'm feeling like my clients value my brand being small. Cool. What kind of services do you sell? So yes, you, there's tons and tons of businesses. The government de deems small business, any business with 199 employees or less. So if you have 199 employees or less, the government deems you a small business, not even a medium, small. Um, the small aspect of your business just needs to be represented in your brand values. It's like, great, small means better quality, more attention to detail, 
Uh, it means that I pick up the phone. I'm going to not have a customer representative in a different country that doesn't speak my language. It's it's going to be great. I want to work with a small business or a local eatery, and I'm going to deal with the owner. So so great. You want to try and find new clients, but still having that small feel. Um, I can identify with that. I I hear you there. Um, people are buying from you because they like your story and they like your product. If they didn't like either, they probably wouldn't buy in the first place. If they didn't like your products, they'll buy them once and never come back. And if they don't like what your business stands for, again, they might make one person, one purchase if you're lucky and never come back as well. So the story doesn't need to change too much. The story is like, great, we grew a little bit. Still a small business. You have three employees, five, 10 employees, you're still a small business. Um, so I don't think you're going to be in the trouble of people not thinking that you're small. Um, the other option there is finding new clients that will have your brand. You can set up rules around what clients are going to work for. So if you're selling clothing, you can just say, great, you're the authorized clother. You're the authorized cust uh, a B2B customer in this specific geographical area. And there's no one around you that can sell your, uh, my products. So, so great. I can create exclusivity through the partnership agreements I've got saying, great, you are the only store in Ontario that can sell my stuff if I'm doing a B2B wholesale play. And it still stays exclusive and small, and, but you can still bring on new clients in terms of, great, well, I need to find a, a, a seller in Manitoba or in New York or Chicago or in somewhere else, and I can have those agreements. So the B2B exclusivity is a big one. It's like, great, I can bring on more clients, but you're, you still have a territorial region that it's yours. And again, that's probably, that's probably because you're small, you're probably not going to be able to scale that up internationally overnight. So creating those, those channels. And I, I would hold those retailers to a fairly high standard. If, you're, if I'm going to give you exclusivity, that comes with privileges and responsibilities. And you get to set the privileges and you get to set the responsibilities. And if they're not meet, meeting the responsibilities, they don't get the privileges. So yeah, mostly B2C. So when you're, when you're, when you're saying mostly B2C, but you say find new clients, but so B2C clients, B2C clients aren't going to know how big your business is actually. You're going to, you're going to have a small business and you could have one person operating your house, or you could have three or four people operating out of a small lease space, or you could have 15 people working out of, out of, uh, of, a, the, the whole main floor of a, of a, of a building, the, the optics of it are, it needs to be high quality. You're not going to lose the, the, the overall feel of what you're doing. But at the end of the day, the B2C customers aren't getting a first glance look inside the operations of your business. I think Aaron wants to jump in here. I see the camera come on. That's funny. I was just uh, interacting with the link. I was looking at the uh, link to the clothing store, reading the comments in the chat. Um, I mean, from the question, feeling like my clients value my brand being small, sure people can, um, growing your audience without losing, uh, the existing clients trust. I just, I so wouldn't worry about it is like, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to be too, um, dismissive, dismissive of it. Cause like, I understand your concern as a small business owner. Um, but just don't start doing really like sketchy, scammy stuff or producing content that doesn't feel personal. Like as long as, as long as the things you're doing to grow the brand are still growing the existing brand and you're not like suddenly starting to advertise uh, as if you were like target, uh, you're, you're going to be fine. Like if the messaging is consistent with everything you've been doing and you see it in, and your customers start to see it in more places, uh, all that's going to do is encourage your existing customers to continue making more purchases, which you want. Um, and if they are loyal to you as a small brand, most of the time people will be happy um, to see you growing, to see you doing well. I mean, I, for me as a consumer, um, if I see a company I purchased from or worked with take out a bus ad and I just see it in the wild, I just I have this little moment of excitement like, oh, I know those guys. I um, I hired an electrician to do some work on my house um, several months back. And every time I see his little, like it's the lowest quality thing, but it's a little print ad on a fence outside of Tim Hortons. 
And every time I drive through that drive through, I have this moment of like, aha, I know him. It's that guy who helped me out. And so I think, uh, you know, the idea that your clients are going to be put off by um, advertising your businesses in any way, um, as long as you're not too aggressive, um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. And by that, I mean, like, you're going to be fine with passive ads, anything, Google ads, social media posting, any of that's going to be fine. Uh, don't send people 50 emails a day, uh, no matter what size your business is, because they're not going to like that. Um, I just try to put yourself in the consumer's shoes. Like, is it something that would make you mad? Because if it is, it's probably gonna make your customers mad. And if it's really not something you would think too hard about, your customers probably aren't going to either because um, yeah. they're just normal people at the end of the day. So there should, and that, that's a really good point. And you should try and find a role model. And most business owners have this where you look up to another business and go, oh my goodness, like look at them. And they're normally bigger. They normally have more money. They normally have been doing it for longer. They normally have all the advantages that you don't have as a business owner where you're where you are. We have those. Like we're a small marketing agency, and we look up to some of like the biggest New York based companies. Like oh, like the stuff they're doing. Like they're working with pro athletes, and they're doing X and Y. And look at the they've got they've got equipment that's worth more than our entire business. Like they've you know like movie level production, everything. And it's like oh, that's super sweet. But we look up to those people for inspiration. As, as business owners, because it's like, we're still dreaming ourselves. Like this is where we're trying to get to inch by inch by inch. And the goal is how do they treat their customers? I want to treat, I, that's something I can control. I can treat my customers better than they can treat their customers because I have direct control over it. So great. They might have different advantages, but that you as a small, a small business, small boat, you're going to be able to turn around and pivot and do things with more attention to detail than they will. Um, but yeah, you're not going to be Disney in, in, in three years. Um, with that said, if you have any other questions in chat, like this is going great. The more, again, the more you give, the more you get from us. This is the, the whole portion of this. Um, when it comes to the strategy, I know we're trying to keep things general because there's a whole pile of different business models and people at different stages in, in business in this, in this group right now. But as a whole, choose two of your top marketing persuasions like scarcity and authority if you are that perfume brand or or liking and commitment if you're if you're selling the vegan products great um and focus on those and your goals as a business owner should line up with those marketing persuasions how you measure your business success should be in line with those things you should create and customize your content so that's text image video anything print material based on the decision models. What do they care about? What information they're looking for? What are their biggest pain points? How does it address them? As well as factoring in those two marketing persuasions. So if they need that social proof, they should get it in those, in those ads or in those graphics or how much human element plays. Identify the channels that people are operating in and then start posting that content. We recommend starting like a 30, 60 day spread. So like build content for 30 to 60 days, sit down on a Sunday, build it out. If it takes a couple of days to do it, but do it all at once. Like if you're gonna try and do daily posting, do all of the work on one day and then do all of the posting throughout or schedule it, use a piece of software to schedule it throughout the month. Once you've got some data pulling in, reflect on what worked, what didn't work, apply a critical eye on it, repeat the analysis for the next 30 days and repeat it. So not very difficult. If you're just starting out, it's going to seem a little rocky. It's going to be like, oh, what the heck am I doing? Again, pick two persuasions and ask yourself, does my messaging fit into these categories? If it's a no, change it. If it's a yes, good. Just a binary, binary. Does it fit into the persuasion? Yes or no? Is it on the right channel? Yes. No. Is it information my audience cares about? Yes or no? And then post it. And it's as, it's as easy as that. There are some things that play over time. So if you're posting video um, on YouTube, for example, don't expect a million views on day one. There's a longevity to that. So that kind of breaks my working model here. You might need to give it more time than 30 days to determine if that video was successful or not because it'll have zero views the minute you post it. And after one week, it'll have more. And after two weeks, it'll have even more and three weeks and four weeks and so on and so forth. And if it's a little more evergreen, same thing for a blog. 
if it's a social media post, it's there one minute and gone. So it's probably going to take you less time to do, but the data will be a little bit more exact for that specific time frame. Any ideas on how to organize content? I'm struggling with consistency. So that is great. Some of the biggest agencies that are other brands that we work with use just a Google Doc and they go, great, here it is. They run it off of columns and they put the, the, the hashtags in one column and they put the photo, photo or the edited graphic in one column and the text in another. And then their employee builds it and then it get, goes through a copywriter and it gets edited and approved. And then they put that. Normally it goes into a piece of software at the end of the day for scheduling software. We use Hootsuite. Hootsuite's pretty cool. It's one of the only pieces of software that uses LinkedIn. So I don't have too much experience I can share with you on schedulers that are using like TikTok or that, that need to run off of a bunch of channels all at once. But the one that we use, Hootsuite does a whole bunch of channels and it does LinkedIn, which is really, really good. Um, the consistency is really important. So you wanna try and create yourself some criteria around creating content. And that's ultimately what this slide here is saying is, does it make these criteria, yes or no? And when you're building that content at the end of that, before you're, you're satisfied with it, you need to ask yourself those questions. Does it, is it in line with this persuasion? Yes or no? If it's, and if it's a no, that means you, you, you shouldn't post it. You should, re, re, should retweak it. You might need to reword it, do something different. Ultimately, you should start with a set of goals. It's I'm going to post a piece of content on X. And with that in mind, that should already meet the, the criteria of what you're trying to accomplish. So what I said before was writing down all of the questions you get answered for like an entire month. Um, I know those will be relevant to my customer base so that the, the purchasing decision model is met. And now I just need a way to phrase the answers in a way that meets the marketing persuasion. So the content is there. I have my question for my audience. I know it's being asked, great. I need to choose the channel that it's going to best perform on. That's going to be under your control, whether it's a video or a tech or a piece of text in an image. Fine. I need to make it fit into one of the persuasion categories now. So whether it's it's one or the other, cool. And then now it's about just filling that out. Normally, with those question those question based solutions, you can run those questions like every sixty days. So like, great, you're going to turn that into evergreen content. If it produces well, turn up, turn it into a blog post. If it's more than that, turn it into a video, do something. Maybe I need to share that every, during the post-purchase process for everyone. Um, so the idea is to organize, use a spreadsheet, use a spreadsheet, use a, use, use software to help. Uh, sticky notes work. If you're interested, Kanban is probably the one of the most popular type of non- um, software solutions, Kanban, I'm going to bring this up, Kanban board, I'm just going to share my screen with a Kanban board, if you've ever seen like a really like tech office or something like that, so if, I'll just share this screenshot, this is a Kanban board, oh, hold on a second, Kanban board, you can bring that up, if you've seen one, it's like, great, I'll, I'll, I'll color code some sticky notes. I'll put them in a chart. I'll stick them on the wall. I'll put them on the refrigerator. I'll put them on a whiteboard. And the blue ones represent my marketing persuasion and the green ones represent X and Y. And then you just break them down by color and content. And then you can do it that way. And that way from a visual standpoint, great. It's low impact. Most businesses can afford sticky notes. And I would just do it like that. So if you're writing down your questions, you can just put them directly on the sticky notes put them on your Kanban board. And then the, the columns running left to right are just to do, doing, validate, and done. So you'll have a whole bunch of them to, to do and now you'll build it out into the doing and then validate that the post went through and you've answered all the comments and then, okay, it's done, pull the board off the board and that's it. And you'll run that over and over and over. It's a really, really common uh, project management style. There's software that replicates the that as well. Use sticky notes. Should the content be matched based on the topic, for example, educational entertainment? Um, depends. So like YouTube, you'll probably develop a playlist where all of that content is batched so that way if someone is looking for it, they'll find it. Um, if it's like we develop a whole set of stock photography images as a business, 
So like we group all of the visual assets for people to use to make it easier to find. For social media content, things really don't need to be batched like that because you're like not all of your buyers are in the same part of their buyer's journey. So like not everyone is at the same point. So you don't need to put like all of like the newcomer content, like January is not newcomer month. And then February is like warranty month. And then March is like product instruction, best usage guideline month. It should just be a good mix of everything. But yeah, some things need to be batched and some things don't. If, um, if it helps you organize it, you can, you can create batches in terms of like weekly content, like, oh, great, I'll do two comedy posts and I'll do one educational post. I'll do like two throwback posts and I'll do like three community shout outs and I'll do that. I'll batch that. And that goes out every week. And that way, like that's part of my strategy in terms of it every week, my audience is seeing all of that. if that makes sense. So you can set some guidelines on it. And again, it depends. So like we use video a lot. We use a lot of video. Um, and we still we still organically post on, on Instagram, but like a video to produce takes a lot more time than just a normal post. So the more effort you put into your posting or the, the communication that you've got, the longer it needs to exist for, for a small business to recapture the value of it. So like if you are posting a lot of video, um, and it's not just an Instagram reel or a TikTok video. Um, you're, you're really looking for quality. And then if you're going to go on the light end side, you're looking for volume. So if you're going to do a bunch of Instagram reels, it's like, I want to try and film 80 Instagram reels. My cat agrees with me. We film a lot of stuff here. So like if I'm doing low budget, low time commitment, I need lots. And if I'm doing a little bit more budget, high quality, it just needs to be good. And it might need to be a four minute explainer video or a, something technical or assembly instructions with good lighting and a script and all of the written instructions beside it. And they need to be closed captioning and everything. It really depends on the, on the, on what you're trying to achieve. Cool. That's it. That's it. That's all. We've been asking questions for a little bit. Great. We have another workshop coming up on how do you leverage your Shopify data? It is happening June. When is it happening? June. I'll tell you when it's happening. It's happening June 15th. It's going to go over how to actually leverage the data that Shopify provides you in the back end. You don't need to be on any crazy plan to actually, it's not, you don't need to be on Shopify Plus for that. It's just the basic Shopify core plan, the $29.99 a month plan. If you've got a POS, that'll, that'll be a bonus, but you don't, if you're not using POS, that's fine as well. So yes, you can sign up for that one. It's free as well. It's a really on. important one to sign up for. I, uh, I want to take a moment to like aggressively plug it. Most small business owners recognize that data is super important. And most small business owners have no idea what to do with their data. So they value having it, but they have no idea how to actually implement it. And if that sounds familiar to you, or you're not valuing your data and really should be, uh, check out that workshop because the actual analytics data you get access to through Shopify is massively impactful. There's a lot you can do with it. And to really understand how your business is performing, um, that's one of the most important things to look at. I will put no, I will put a link right there for you. You can sign up right here. Us again, we are your Ontario Shopify partner that runs all of the meetups for this. It keeping it on the down low, we're going to be looking to do some in person workshops, hopefully, in the near future with Shopify at Shopify's offices in Waterloo, which would be super cool. Keep a word out for that. If you want to be in touch with that, we will be announcing that stuff through our social media and through our email marketing channel. So if you want to be in touch with in-person workshops that'll be coming up, you can find us on LinkedIn and you can add us on LinkedIn, which we'll, we'll, we will be announcing it there for sure. I'll put a link to that. Cat, my cat's excited about in-person workshops. 
So if you are interested in in-person workshops and attending and you'll see us and it'll be fun. And if you haven't been to Shopify's offices in Waterloo, there it looks like you're in a different planet because we're the most valuable company in Canada. Um, you can follow us there and you'll be in, in touch. You'll, you'll see all the things and you can sign up um, or connect with Aaron and I and you'll see that as well. Other than that, we're gonna send everyone in this call a quick survey on how you felt the workshop went and any future topics that you think that we should cover. We'd really appreciate you filling it out because we definitely want to make these workshops as relevant as, as, relevant as possible to small business owners or any kind of struggle that you're particularly uh, worried about or focusing on or trying to get a solution to, we're happy to help and we'll build out a whole bunch of content specifically for those problems. We just need your feedback. It'll take a few minutes. I'm gonna have Aaron put that link in chat for you. Oh, it's gonna get sent. It's gonna get sent actually. He's not gonna put this link in chat for you. It's gonna get sent to the whole list. Cool. Yes, Michelle, I have a cat that meows like crazy. And like, sometimes it's adorable. And other times um, it's um, not adorable. Rebecca, absolutely. If you sign up for the other workshop, but you don't make it, uh, the recording will go out after the works up, just like for this one. We do it every time. Yep. You can see previous workshops on YouTube as well. If you want to look at that, all of the previous ones, if you missed them. Um, we should be releasing the next set of workshops. That's the last one in this series. We should be releasing the next set of six very, very soon, I'm hoping. And those will be available online. But again, if you do want to give us some feedback on topics to cover, we will absolutely take that into consideration because those six have not been built yet. I am, uh, I'm going to drop a link to our YouTube channel as well, Ooh. in case anyone is interested in checking that out. Because as, as Matt mentioned, that does have all of our past workshops and also uh, a ton of other videos that you might find useful. So we don't do a heck of a lot of marketing on YouTube. It's all, um, it's all content that we thought would be useful to our existing clients. And might be useful to some of you as well. So there's a lot of guides on there about um, how to use Shopify, including some of their latest features. The online store 2.0 update introduced a ton of good stuff that we delve into uh, in quite a bit of detail, step by step on our YouTube channel. And then there's more basic ones like, you know, top five things most uh, Shopify merchants miss, uh, top five branding mistakes that we see, um, five reasons to start email marketing. So like there's a lot in there. Um, that you should find uh, really relevant as a small business owner selling the e-commerce space. Right on. Any, that was like a big 2H media plug, which is awesome. And we, we we're trying to give out again, that whole, was that marketing persuasion where you give it a whole bunch of? Oh yeah, reciprocity is our reciprocity? favorite. We try to give out as much free stuff as we can. Um, reciprocity? I don't yeah. Want to, to you that we're good people and we produce good content, we just give it to you. Yeah. yeah, here, I'll drop our Unsplash too while we're oh. doing reciprocity because we built a whole free stock image library. Uh, we try to add to it every day. That's a, I will actually give Shara, Sarah a public shout out. Sarah does all of our photography here and that library just cracked 10 million views nine hours yeah. ago. Which is pretty cool. It's, it's royalty good. free, attribution free. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to pay us for it. You don't even have to give us credit if you don't want to. We like when you do, obviously, but there's really no pressure. We don't want that to be a barrier to using it. All right. Any questions in terms of communication, strategy, platforms, best practices? The floor is open for questions. If you don't have a question, you're absolutely free to leave and you will get the full recording in the next couple. I know I'm gonna get asked, this is like, hey, when's the recording? Great, this has been an hour and a half so far. So there's a little bit of rendering that has to happen. Normally they go out within probably, a few days of this. Probably Friday. Yeah. It'll be Friday or Monday, but probably Friday. So great, we promise you'll get it. Other than that, floor is open for questions. Any recommendations on building audience before a new launch? Holy smokes. Are you talking to the right person with that? Aaron? I did a workshop earlier today. <laughs> Aaron did a workshop on Kickstarter on, on crowdfunding. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to ask for a little bit of clarification. Is that a new business launch or a new product launch? Because they're very different things. 
products, new product launch. So um, you're going to rely on a lot of your uh, existing social media channels, your existing website. You've got a ton of prime real estate in your hero sections to tell people, hey, this big thing that you're going to be excited for is coming soon. Um, the big question there is like, how far in advance are we talking? Because if it's coming really soon and you can start to put out some images, that's going to obviously really help with your social media. That's going to help with that website content. Um, if you are like really early in production and you're before any of that, maybe your product is uh, a little more technical. I would just start talking about it. Talk about it to whoever you can, uh, either in social media or in in-person events. Um, what, uh, what industry are you building products in? Is this something techy? Is it something very simple? Cosmetics. Um, so again, I would go back to the very beginning of our presentation where we talked about what problem you're solving. And I would start there. I would start talking about that problem on social media channels. Um, go, go back to like the why, why is this new product coming out? Because you probably already sell a ton of cosmetics. Uh, so what's this new one doing that's different than your existing product line and start to build some buzz around that idea prior to actually releasing the product. So when you actually say, Hey, we've got this new product. Now it's, Hey, we've got this new product that solves this problem that we've already primed you to be thinking about. There is an interesting tactic. Um, and let me let me finish all the way on this because it's it doesn't it's not uh, as 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 native as you might think it is. There are tons of businesses out there that use focus groups, and the at at face value thought is a focus group is going to help you to develop the product, and you're going to get feedback in that environment, and, and great. Um, most of the time, most of that feedback is garbage, and the people that go to focus groups are the people that like to go to focus groups and they like to be heard and they like to put their fingerprint on things. One of the main reasons to have a focus group is to actually generate word of mouth marketing. And the goal there is I can get a bunch of people that like having their opinion heard in, in a room, the people that attend focus groups, and I can show them something before it launches and I can get their opinion on it and I can get them talking about it. And then when they leave, they're going to go tell people that they were just in a focus group on X and Y and Z, and this is this, and this is how this works, and, and they're an early adopter. And if you can arrange some of those things, you can really get that word of mouth going early on, and you just don't need to have any kind of NDA or, or, or silence protection around what people are actually seeing in the hopes that those people will just talk about it at lunch. Um, and if there was a, there needed to be like a paid opportunity, you can just give them product. But the goal there is I can get 10 people in a room that are all interested in the specific subject I'm at, and I can prime them with a bunch of questions, and they're going to go into that environment and share a bunch of it, especially if that focus group room has some Instagram-worthy photo opportunities. People will take the time to show off that they're doing something cool with your product, and you can start the word of mouth that way.